So good to see you. Let's stand together and begin our time of worship tonight. Oh, worship the King. One, two. It's good to see you tonight. We can state the obvious. It is hot. Okay? It is hot. Not in here. Claudia, wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at least today, the air conditioner is working well in this room and uh, keeping us all nice and cool. But it is definitely hot outside, and it will stay that way until it's not. And you can take comfort in that, okay? All right. Good to see you tonight. And uh, we've had a great day in the Lord already. For those of you that were in our early time of worship this morning, you'd want to know in the second service, it's one of those times when after one verse, I didn't see any movement, so I was ready to shut her down and go to the house. And out of the, my peripheral vision, I saw movement. So we had to crank back up again. We had two children make professions of faith in the second service this morning, both of whom, well, uh, not both of whom, one of whom had, had been at kids camp and uh, another one had been 
uh, talking to mom and dad for some time about what this meant and what they wanted to do. And God's Holy Spirit just got a hold of them. And they came this morning. And so we celebrate that. And we'll be planning baptism here in the next few weeks and looking forward to that opportunity. But it was a good morning. We had, uh, you know, it's back to school time, which means hopefully that some folks are settling back into a more normal routine. And we, uh, we had a, a good, good participation, good attendance in our time of worship this morning. Now, this week is uh, it's going to be a busy one, y'all. There are a lot of different opportunities that are there in your worship guide that, I, again, I hope you're playing, paying attention to. Uh, we are beginning a new semester, if you want to call it that, of our Kid First Weekday Early Education Ministry. They had their open house this afternoon. And, and I, you, you need to know that that is a ministry outlet that touches a lot of families and a lot of children that are not connected to our church. And yet these folks have heard about the ministry. They've heard about the reputation of what happens up here on Tuesday and Thursday. And they gladly and willingly bring their kids and entrust them to our care. So I got to meet several new folk this afternoon and we're looking forward to a new semester. Uh, those relationships will be strengthened over the, the school year as the kids come every week uh, for that all day time, Tuesday and Thursday. So pray for Kid First as they begin their fall semester this week. Awana will begin on Wednesday night. Our senior adult luncheon is going to be on, on Tuesday. And appropriately, the theme is the dog days of summer. I'm anxious to see what that program is going to look like. But anyway, the dog days of summer. And, and indeed, there, there we are. A lot of other things that are happening. And so just pay attention to those. But again, so glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Let's stand together and continue in the word tonight in this passage from 1 Thessalonians. Say this one with me. 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. Wonderful. Take a moment to speak a hello to somebody there close to you as we continue our time of worship together.
got some crackling somewhere. Okay, let's kill this microphone. This, this wireless has died. This mic has died. So I'm going to pick up wireless one. We'll call the man and get a new one tomorrow. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks, I can't get that out of my mind now.
Let's pray together. Father, you know us best. We are apt to say things along the way that sound good, that are socially acceptable, but that we may or may not believe. We find ourselves trapped at times between the platitudes and even the lessons that we learned in our childhood or youth and the harsh realities of life. And sometimes it just doesn't fit. We're guilty of projecting onto you our failures, our weaknesses and our inadequacies. We grab hold of you and drag you down to make you like one of us. That gives us a little bit more control and sometimes a little bit more understandability. But we come before you tonight and we acknowledge, because we've been singing this, that you're not like us. And you're not inconsistent and you're not unfair. You are God. So my prayer is help us. Please, Father, help us with the disappointments. Help us with the failures. Help us with the hurt. Help us, Father, to put it into a, a right perspective, to be able to draw close to you, to bow humbly before you and to worship you, to acknowledge who you are, and at the same time, deal with life. Thank you for the power of the truth of your word and the working of your Holy Spirit among us even now. Thank you for what you will do and are doing already in these moments. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Every now and again, at a moment like that, I think the Church of Christ have got it. But then I've been in some bad a cappella renditions, and I thank the Lord for instrumentation. Because good instruments can cover a multitude of singing sins. Whew. Reading and getting ready for this week, this message tonight, it, it just reminded me that we have the gross potential of misunderstanding the nature of God, of misunderstanding who He is and how He is with us. And you may be in here tonight, and if you are, I'll not divulge your identity because I can't remember who said it to me. But it was after a set of songs like we've sung tonight, which, by the way, are powerful, powerful songs. Great worship songs that have a recurring theme, the title of this sermon, God is Good. And I remember the lady with absolute sincerity she was obviously hurt. She was uh, emotional as she told me this. She said, you may have noticed that I got up and left this morning. And I had. I'd seen her walk out, but I, y'all walk out all the time, so that doesn't bother me a whole lot. I mean, I've come to expect it. But then she said to me, I couldn't sing the songs. Okay. I tried. I forced the words out a time or two, but then it stuck right here. And I just couldn't say it any longer, so I decided I better leave. There was a backstory. There was some tough stuff going on in her life, some struggles, some trials, like we've talked about in the first part of the book of James. And she had wrestled with those and wondered how could a good God how could a loving God allow or lead me into or let me experience this? And she had concluded, at least at that moment, I don't think a good God could. So it was just easier for me to get up and leave than to pretend that I believe something that in this moment I'm not sure I believed. Obviously, in the hallway surrounded by people was not the moment to pursue that and to try to talk her out of her conviction. She was being honest. And I appreciated that. So when I got to this two-verse section tonight, I thought, you know what? It's not automatic. We don't just automatically believe that God is good. Oh, it's a prayer that many of us learned as children. It's the training wheels prayer. It's the getting your child to pray before the meal prayer. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. 
And I, I remember being content with that early on. I remember the, the unsettled feeling I had as the preacher father with my kids when I wanted them to pray something a little bit more prayerful, you know. And then we graduated and they started praying for everybody they knew and every circumstance they could think of while the food got cold. And so then I longed for the old days. God is good. God is great. Let's thank him for the food. Amen. God is good. James got into that place where obviously some that have uh, been in correspondence with him have made some suggestions. Obviously, somebody has suggested earlier, you know, God led me to, God put me in a position where I had to, and there was this idea that some of the trials and temptations that they had succumbed to, some of their failures in life because they had given in to the temptation were on God, and they, they placed that blame on God. And so we got to that part last Sunday night. We said, well, hold on, don't, don't any of you say when you were tempted that you're tempted by God. And they went, went on to develop that idea. But apparently it was of enough import that he said, no, no wait a minute, we're not done with that. Let, let's talk about that a little bit more. Let, let's talk about what you're thinking and saying when you, when you have the idea that God is somehow up there pulling the strings like a puppet master you being the puppet, God is, God is orchestrating things in your life to purposefully lead you to succumb to temptation, to watch you wallow around in your mess that you've made, and to somehow take some kind of sordid delight in that. Careful, careful. And so then this very practical theologian, and he is, this, this person who wants us to not only think about God, but wants us to know God in such a way that it changes the way we live and changes the way we think on a daily basis about God, comes to these next two verses. Uh, some have suggested they're out of place, that they don't fit, that this is a disjointed devotional that was thrown in there by some editor along the way, or perhaps by James himself. No, I, I think it fits absolutely perfectly. Verse 17 and 18, he wrote, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. All right. So I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to tell you before we get started that this is probably not going to carry us to 7 o'clock. And so if you are feeling like you're going to be cheated, if this doesn't go to 7 o'clock, so be it. Uh, you're going to be cheated. But I want you to carry this home with you because I feel like some of you probably are more like that young lady that I mentioned in the beginning that you would care to admit. And you wrestle with, this was my prayer earlier, how does that good God fit with my bad life? How does that intersect? So here's what James had to say. He began, I think, the first part of the text is just reminding us about the perfect nature of God's generous gifts. I mean, he'd already made it clear that no temptation to sin comes from the Father. Uh, it's, just not, it's just not who God is. God is not that that God who deliberately wants to see his children fail, who deliberately wants to see his children broken, who deliberately wants to see us mired in the consequences of our very poor choices. He's just not that God. I, uh, as, as a parent, I've watched parents who, who seem to take some sadistic glee out of their child who falls down or has a bicycle wreck or, or falls off the bunk bed or whatever. They... they they giggle. They, they laugh about it. It's a, a big hoot and a holler. Uh, you're sick. You're sick when you take delight in your child's pain. That's not normal. And our Heavenly Father does not take delight in our brokenness. And so he, 
He's already addressed this. No temptation to sin comes from the Father. But then he goes a step further to address this fundamental character of God. Our God is indeed a good God. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. I've heard so many times a familiar offertory prayer where we pray for the offering and we have this familiar phraseology, bless the gift and the giver. You've heard that a bazillion times. Bless the gift and the giver, usually coupled with and the sick of the church. And then at our missionaries around the world, and forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name, amen. I mean, you've covered all the bases at that point. The gift and the giver, the sick of the church. Truth be known, that covered probably about 80% of the people in the room who are sick of the church and, and want to be better, but they just, they just can't handle it at that particular moment. Bless the gift and the giver. James backs up from that and says, hey, let's talk about the gift and the giver. Pointing to the fact that both the divine gift what he offers and the divine giver are both good. The gift, as we open it up, is a good gift. The giver who has been motivated to provide the gift is a good giver himself. We often describe certain people as, as good gift givers. They have a knack for picking the appropriate gift, the useful gift, the enjoyable gift. And so with that as a backdrop, we consider God's gift giving abilities. How is it that God is able? How, how, what is it about God that, that allows him to be so spot on as it comes to pouring himself into our life, not only as a gift that represents who he is in our life, but then his motivation to give? What's, what's working here? It helps as you are giving gifts to know your recipient. When you don't know somebody, you don't know what they like and dislike, you don't know what makes them tick. It's hard to buy them a gift. I mean, you, you can give them a gift card, that innocuous one size fits all gift. You can, and well, here's what we often do. Here's what I often do. I'm not going to put this on you. I'm going to put it on me. I'm thinking sometimes as I buy gifts, I like it. Surely they will like it. Do you know what I've discovered over the years? Everybody doesn't like the same things I like. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? And you've probably gotten some gifts over the years where you thought when you opened up, what were they thinking? And I don't know, I can't get inside their heads, but, but it's a, there's a good possibility they were thinking one of a couple of things. One, they were thinking, I like this and I know they're going to like it too. Number two, they might've been thinking they don't like anything. So it doesn't matter what I'm going to give them. I'm just going to get them this. And, and they carried on. But the reality is as God moves toward the gift, toward pouring out himself into our life in some fashion, we have to acknowledge God knows us best. He knows where you've been, what you've been through, how you've been shaped to become the person you are in this moment. He knows where you are today, perfectly where you are today. And then beautifully, God sees beyond today to tomorrow. And so the gifts that he brings are appropriate to all of that knowledge and his experience with us. Number two, he knows our situation. He knows the details of your life, some that many that you don't even know, the forces that come to bear, the relationships that you were a part of, a part of the circumstances that are unfolding. God knows. And here's the beauty of that gift. Some of them we open up and we're like, I don't know. What was he thinking? And then in a week or a month or six months, one day, it's like, wow, that was perfect. It fits beautifully for where I am today. And that's because he knew our situation. So he gives gifts. Uh, and, and when I say gifts, obviously we're thinking about presents. We're thinking about those things that we exchange with one another. But, but the blessings of God, God's provision in our life. And that comes in so many different forms. The way that God shows himself to us, reveals himself to us, and provides for us. It's, it's so varied that it's difficult to nail it down. But, but whatever it is that comes from the Father, whatever it is that God pours into our life as he knows us and knows our, our situation, he gives to us those gifts that are appropriate to us. They fit us and they are appropriate to the moment, to the situation. And the beauty is God's gifts will never be useless 
are inappropriate. We're never going to receive something from our Heavenly Father and say, with any intellect at all, we will never say, what will I do with that? What am I going to do with that? You treasure it, you hold on to it, and you acknowledge that as God makes himself known, as God reveals himself to us, as God gives himself to us in whatever form that gift, that revelation, that provision may come, we can trust, we can trust completely that every good thing given and every perfect gift is indeed from above, from our Heavenly Father, and we can be grateful. But behind that, he goes one step forward. He opens this up just a little bit more for us and talks about not only the perfect nature of God's generous gifts, but the unchanging nature of God's character. Yeah, he's good, but he's also a God who doesn't change. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Here's that phrase, in great is thy faithfulness, that I've sung since I was a kid. It has not changed. There is no shadow of turning with thee. I will tell you that for the longest time I had not a clue what that meant. It just kind of flowed easily off the tongue, and I liked the way it sounded in one of my favorite hymns. You get to James chapter 1, verse 17b, and there it is. The songwriter actually consulted the Bible as he wrote the song. There is scripture right there in the verse as we sing it together. James pointed us and reminded us that, that God is the creator God, the one who's made everything that we see, the one who, who spoke it into being, pointed to God as the creator, and then gave him this title, Father of Lights. The title is an infrequently used title, but one that acknowledges that God created the heavens and the earth, created the, the light and all the heavenly reflectors of that light. He acknowledged that, that there is variation up there. Uh, and the variation may just be what we see. Uh, the stars do not go away at night. We step outside and we may say, where'd the stars go? I can't see the stars. They must have disappeared tonight. They didn't disappear. They're where they've been. They're up there. It's just the clouds, the, the haze, the whatever uh, may obscure our view of the stars. Uh, now, do the stars last forever? No. They can flame out. They can burn out, disappear. There is, there is change in the heavens, but there's not any change in the God who created the heavens and the earth. In his commentary on James, John MacArthur wrote this, The Father of Lights was an ancient Jewish title for God, referring to him as creator, as the great giver of light in the form of the sun, moon, and stars. But unlike those sources of light, which, magnificent as they are, can nevertheless vary and will eventually fade, God's character, his power, his wisdom, and his love have no variation or shifting shadow. Through Malachi, the Lord declares, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3, 6. Through John, we're told that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1, 5. And through the writer of Hebrews, we are assured that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. The celestial bodies that God created have various phases of movement and rotation, changing from hour to hour and varying in intensity and shadow. God, however, is changeless. changeless. Oh, we're not. We change. It might be just from the natural process of aging. We change. We're getting older. I sometimes enjoy seeing people I haven't seen in a while. Sometimes. Some of our kids who've grown up in our church, they come back to town and run into them in town. I see them. Some of them I like to see. Because some of them will say things like, Brother Clint, you have not changed one bit. <laughs> Others will look at me and say, whew, you're getting old. <laughs> well, it's on YouTube. We change. Some of you change more frequently, though, than your aging process. Some of you are moody. Oh, you know it. I don't have to call your name. I'll not make eye contact right now. I'll just look at the lights. You're moody. You know who you are. 
You change from moment to moment, from day to day. You're happy one day and you're mad the next. You're approachable one day and like a prickly porcupine the next. Oftentimes, depending on your circumstances, we just don't know. The old saying, you throw your hat into the room before you come in just to see what's going to happen. You change. God doesn't change. I'm through with that. I'll look at you again. Sometimes people take this and begin in Genesis, continue to Malachi, skip the intertestamental period and move into Matthew and read to Revelation and come to the conclusion, oh, there's one God in the Old Testament. Something happened between Malachi and Matthew and he changed. And when Jesus showed up, we get a different God. And then when the Holy Spirit came, we get a different God. So God has changed from the Old Testament angry, law-giving God to meek and mild Jesus to charismatic Holy Spirit. I suppose I could try to understand that conclusion, but whether I understand it or not, it's completely off base because the God who's there in Genesis 1-1 is the same God who's there at the end of the book of Revelation. The Old Testament God and the New Testament God are the same God. Father God, Son God, and Holy Spirit God do not represent competing and disparate entities, but God is unchanging from beginning to end. But Clint, you'd say, but what about, and what about our understanding of God? Our ability to comprehend what God was up to at any given moment? That's limited and that's faulty. God is the same God. And whether we can grasp it or want to accept it or not, that's the truth of Scripture. We can count on and trust in the changeless nature of God. He will not change. Which brings us to the third part of the text. Again, some disconnect verse 18 and make it a, a, a little passage unto itself. I think it flows directly out of what he's just talked about. As he talks about the transformed character of God's children. Remember, he's answering this criticism that perhaps God leads us into temptation. God prompts us to fail. God revels in our struggles and in our brokenness. In verse 18, though, he says very explicitly, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creature. Again, I believe he's answering the skeptics who claim that somehow or another God leads us into evil leads us into those catastrophic failures. By the way, I wonder with those folks sometimes, have they not read the book of Matthew and have they not read Jesus teach his disciples to pray where they prayed and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the character of God, not to destroy us, but to provide a means of escape. And we've talked about that already. Answering the skeptic who claimed that God tempts us to evil, he points to the recreating work of God in our salvation. No, he doesn't want us to self-destruct. God doesn't want us to embarrassingly fail. God wants us to be his new creation. God wants us to be his representative in this broken world working through us. And so with succinctness and yet with whew, great depth and width, he talks about what God has done in the exercise of his will. Well, this salvation is God's work. I mean, this isn't something that we stumble into. This isn't something that we have created, something that we've manufactured. This salvation, this, this plan that, that we are a part of, this church that we belong to, this life that we have inherited, this is God's work. This is his will. This is his plan that we be a part of him in the exercise of his will. Paul talked about it in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 when he said, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God bought it, wrapped it up, and has delivered it to us, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Salvation is God's worth, but also salvation is a new birth. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. Y'all, that's birthing language. By God's design, according to God's will, he has birthed us into this new life. It was not a work 
that we accomplished. It was not something that we, we completed and were given the certificate and granted the salvation. It was a sovereign act of God. Remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How? How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I don't understand it exactly. Exactly. You must be born again. And James says, in the exercise of his will, he birthed us in a way that defies our understanding and defies uh, adequate human explanation. He birthed us into this life. How so? We are brought to life through the power of God's Word. He brought us forth. We were birthed by the Word of truth, James' words. We, we came to life. We came into being through the working of the Word of God in our life. And so that reminds us, that, that teaches us that there is no substitute for the place, the primacy of God's Word in the life of the church. Uh, we, we can't just become uh, a social activist organization. We can't just be a group of people who get together who have common interests. Our life, who we are, is rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. And so we need to, on a regular basis get together and learn together in Bible study the truths of God's Word. We need to worship together, and always that worship together needs to be focused on, centered around the Word of God. I mean, if you, if you listen to somebody preach, and they quote a, a short verse of Scripture, close their Bible, and then launch into their tirade, you need to not go back and listen to that again. You need to, to listen to and be a part of and give yourself to teaching and preaching that is focused on the truth of God's Word. Because it has the power, it has the power to bring us into life and then to nurture us in His life through the shared Word, which is God's revelation of Himself to us. The Holy Spirit works the work of both of conviction of sin and also that work that guides us into all truth. See, that's beyond us. We just open it up and share it. And then God's Spirit shows up and does what only God's Spirit can do. We saw two kids come to faith in Jesus Christ this morning. And that wasn't because of a good camp program or pastor. It wasn't because of a great Sunday school class. It wasn't because of Awana. It wasn't because even of a godly mother and daddy. You want to know why those two kids got saved? Because the Holy Spirit draw them to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we get to be a part of that. And thank God for godly moms and dads. Thank God for a good church, for, for summer camp. All those things are good. But we do all that we can. But it's God's Holy Spirit that draws us to salvation and causes us to be born again. And then why? Why does God save us? James said we're saved to be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. In that setting, in that agricultural setting, that would have been a very common idea. First fruits, the first and best of the crops that were harvested, and usually gave some indication of what the rest of the year was going to look like. And a farmer might be inclined to take that early harvest and store it away in case something happened, a calamity or something else. But you recall in the Old Testament, the Lord asked, for the first fruits as an offering. Just to be reminded, I'm here with you and I have blessed you, you bring this. So now James says, you've been birthed, you've been sent out, you have been commissioned to be a kind of first fruits among my creatures. Now, some suggest that means among the church. You, you are first fruits, and, and you are those that are being saved and, and those that are going to be delivered in the end. While others say he had a, a broader view, and he was saying, I've called you out and I've saved you and put you in this world so that you can be a blessing to a broken world. I tend to like that idea better. God has saved you and is changing you 
so that you can be a blessing to those where you are. Is God good? It's a fair question. Fair question. Base your answer not on your passing circumstances, but on the eternal truth of God's Word and on the eternal character of good of God. God is good. When your kid, your grandkid recites that prayer, don't wait till the end to say amen. When their little innocent voice says God is good, go ahead and say amen. He sure is. Heavenly Father, again, you know us and where we are, where are we are in our situation. And you know our need to have confidence in you, to trust you, and to continue to walk with you. Help our doubts and our fears and our unbelief. Help our ignorance at times of your truth, of your word, and give us that prompting, that energy to dig in a little deeper and to learn more about who you are and to walk more closely with you. Bless this service that we've enjoyed together tonight, but I pray that you'll bless this invitation now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.